Oh, well, some will make a long run, and then we will end this. So if I'm going to get through these two poems, and that will be that. So where is it? Right, yeah. So this is for, hmm. you recognize this shit. <laughs> I gotta find it, right? That's right. Just look for your name, right? And then let's read the shit that's under it. <laughs> All right. All right. Make sure you get the page so you know how to turn over. Right. Okay. Wow, I was well, never mind. Just read it. The point. <laughs> it is where you shall be begrudged and beguiled. It is the place, time, and circumstance of your origin, and it is at the source of your most ardent pursuit. Start from the beginning. Let the professor of mathematics introduce you to the big white house, old and paint peeling, but ample for beginning. You are situated on highway number 58, 160 North Main Street, the town of Oberlin, Ohio, next door to the bird cage where the coeds are clamorous in the night. It is September 1970, the year of moon and honey. Get in your red automobile and head one block south to Lorraine Street, which is Ohio State Highway number 10. Turn left and ease on down the road, destined in the direction of the point. Or start from the other end of this town. Start from Grafton Street, out near its end, where the muddy asphalt spotted with potholes strips through ethnic land. Turn around, come back the other way, and see the Holloway residence, the railroad tracks right up across into South Pleasant Street. See the people, see their churches, see their children hanging loose in the street. See the strange house, see the address of it in the upper left-hand corner of the letters arriving in Lagos, Nigeria. Start all the way back from South and North Carolinas, from Georgia and deeper South. Get them wagons rolling them prayer wheels tuned, and them woolly heads in shape. See, here they come, first generation and third, some of them getting caught, some slipping through on up to Canada, some of them lingering, settling in. Turn left, go one block, and turn right up South Main Street past the one-room police station, the abandoned community center the post office, the courthouse, the desolate edifice in whose creaky halls the most woman, wanted black woman in the world spent clandestine nights concealing and transporting runaways up from the deeps in moonless darkness that rattle and hiss through marsh and swamp over dangerous rivers across the bridge where Clotel leaped up to the huts by the sparkle of the fixed star navigating the firmament in the center of town, turn right again at Main and College Streets, intersecting four upright horsemen galloping in opposite directions, leap across the solitary, redundant railroad tracks where the road abruptly bends and slopes eastward into highway number 10, leading to the point. Pause and reflect, for here the plot disrobes itself. Like an apple slit open by a sharp blade, the heart of the matter is cut in halves and reveals the underlining character of the town. Who goes southward down Main Street over yet the sparsely ubiquitous and solitary tracks where the green painted caboose is fenced by silver wire and haunted past the woodcutter and the great exchange easily accessible from ethnic land. Farther south on down Main Street, arriving at crossroads of highways number 58 and number 20. Pause and reflect. Look straight down highway number 58, 
See the captured runaway rescued by the two halves of the town of Oberlin in procession. Do not continue down that road. Do not follow that procession. Do not go to Wellington. But turn left at the truck stop where hard hats rest on crosses in the night and where Mr. Momo cut four of them down using nothing but his two fists. Head eastward on highway number 20, passing the motel on the right and the wishbone on the left. Enter the curve where the road is overcast and syncopated red by the neon sign signaling from the point. All roads east out of Oberlin lead to the point. And all roads south or north lead to the roads that lead to the point where highways number 10 and number 20 intersect and become one road running from east to west leading to the point where the bricklayer's hog is nesting among the vehicles outside. But what is the point? A sharp and tapering in, a telling and essential feature, a spontaneous friend unexpected in his giant self, point blank, a viewpoint or standpoint of the chalked end of a slick stick dexterously mastered by leaning men bending in poise over the gaming green whose striped and solid colors make beelines into the pockets of the lean men, one of whom wears a cap with a bib on a bald head. Observe this man. Look at him move on clockwise legs around the green, leaning at an angle, bending sideways, his hands constructing bridges that are foundations for the fingers erecting tunnels, his buttocks haunch like the hump on a camel's back, his eyes the eye of needle precision. Pause and reflect. For the point is more than the leaning men and their laughter and the drinking and gambling and cajoling around the four-legged green and the sounds of bowling and pinball machines and the good-natured cursing of those seated and standing at the horse's shoe or the fierce scoping of the owls along the wall and the owls hovering in the darkened corners and alcoves of the wild safari dancers who are stark naked in their fine vines. Yet these are the creatures and the scenes and the sounds constituting the hand-drawn signs on the wall. No checks cash, no vulgarity permitted, no gambling prohibited, no dancing forbidden, no streakers allowed. The creatures and the scenes and the sounds constituting the precise degree, the aim, the purpose, the unit, the exact spot founded by the Hungarian moose who draw the signs and mop the floor and refill the balls in the back rooms, holds forth within the horse's shoe and dot about and divine the wedges of those who serve as well as the pledges of those who are served. Here they come from Lorraine. Here they come from Illyria, Cleveland, and Oberlin, and South Amherst. Here they come in painters, white coveralls, in muddy construction workers' boots, in mini skirts and elevator shoes, and in the clothes worn by reptiles who would be men. Here they come, the old, the young, the fisherman with his homemade reel, the shark with his teeth, the silent one with his bag of cigarettes, the, low, the loud one who drinks green, the wageless bitches with the afternoon detergent in their mouths, the federal aviation boys with the wreckage of jet airplanes in their brains, the three friendly pigs of Oberlin and the one poet in whose breast an agony bleeds from a secret universally known among the dogs of the point and by every living beast in the devil damned town.